Hello, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, as the room populates here, I'll just uh, share some Zoom housekeeping with you. As you know, we can't hear or see you. We know you're there because we see you uh, signed on. Um, but we encourage you, even though we don't have the it open for verbal questions, to submit your questions in the chat box in the Q&A and uh, suggest that you um, do that as they come to mind, because we have a lot of people getting on today and we only have so much time. So if they come to mind, just post them and we'll get to as many as possible. And if we miss any, we'll get to them after. Um, uh, we're broadcasting live from, uh, I happen to be in Porto, Portugal. Um, and you were, and Andrew, where are you? I am in Puerto Rico. In Puerto um... Rico. And so thank you all for being with us today. Uh, I encourage you to, um, if after hearing what you hear today, there are others in your universe and your network and friends of yours that would benefit from hearing what you hear today. There will be a recording that's posted to the Family Office Insights channel, but uh, also probably so a, a landing page where Andrew posts it. Um, so you can review it there or share it with others. And we're also going to be put you in direct touch with Andrew post webinar. So feel free to communicate with him directly. We totally stay out of the way, as you know. And uh, that's true for anybody that you think would benefit from knowing more about what you learned today. So um, just for the record, we're going to be talking today about blockchain and what Andrew's up to uh, in general and what's going on in the marketplace. And then next week, uh, we're going to have a formal pitch for the fund. So just keep that in mind while you participate today, if you care to learn more next week and get into the weeds for the fund. So uh, super grateful for all the Family Office Insights members and guests that are joining us today and going forward. So um, you're always welcome and you're welcome to share this with anybody you care to share it with. Um, and so uh, the uh, uh, as I said, if there's anybody in your in your network that would be benefit from hearing what you hear today and it's it's totally available to you uh so with that andrew thank you oh by the way i have to thank paula for putting us together she's a superstar i hope she signs on and i hope she just heard that but i will tell her anyway um and uh so i'm grateful for, for her introduction and i've enjoyed our conversations up to this point and uh, this should be really interesting uh today so with that Andrew, welcome. Thank you for being here. You want to give us a little background? Sure. Yeah, Arthur, thank you for, for having me. Um, so I'm Andrew Woodruff. I'm the Chief Investment Officer of Black Lotus Capital. Uh, we are a long, short, fundamental-oriented digital assets hedge fund. Uh, we basically spend a lot of time uh, doing bottoms-up research across hundreds of blockchain projects, uh, tokens, assets, you name it, uh, in order to uh, discover and invest in um, about 15 to 25 tokens that we think are the best of the best uh, that we want to hold for the long term. Um, these are assets and projects well beyond Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, we believe that these have uh, great convexity or risk versus reward asymmetry, great blockchain product market fits, um, sustainable, you know, a path to sustainable value capture, competitive moats, you name it. Um, and that we believe institutions will inevitably end up uh, owning uh, once they get access to them or become aware of them. Uh, and then what we do is we hedge those assets um, or that long portfolio uh, with about 20 to 30 shorts that we think are the worst of the worst. So um, uh, this allows us to uh, basically hedge out the beta drawdown and volatility and risk. Uh, especially in the short term, but given that we believe most of these tokens and most tokens in general uh, will eventually trend to zero over time or uh, not go up in price, uh, we believe that we should also be able to um, make alpha on that side as well. 
Uh, these tokens are your typical uh, more Ponzi-like dynamics, uh, no competitive moats, race to the bottom. Uh, you know, they're not the, the best in their category for their utility or sector or anything like that. And they're usually very high inflation, high dilution assets. Um, so, uh, so that's our strategy. Um, my background uh, is I spent most of the last decade uh, in traditional finance uh, at a long, short uh, generalist equities hedge fund. Uh, that happened to be one of the earlier ones into the the crypto tokens world. And, you know, through that experience, um, you know, I ended up helping uh, lead the build out of their crypto investment research processes, data analytics, uh, going to conferences, meeting lots of, uh, you know, different people across this uh, industry and learning a lot. And uh, the reason why um, I decided to leave that career path to go pursue uh, Black Lotus Capital and do something of our own is simply because um, uh, just the level of investment research and risk management quality that I was used to in the equities world, uh, we, we we just weren't really seeing it much in the um, uh, in the digital assets world. So we wanted to fill that gap, notably for for institutional grade uh, funds and everything. Um, we kicked off fundraising about five months ago. We're aiming for a hundred million, and um, and we have a lot to talk about here. So I want to. Uh, make this as informative as possible. Arthur, feel free to ask me any questions under the sun, and uh, I'll do my best to try to you know answer them and and be helpful wherever I can. Great. Yeah. One of the things that uh, first I think is that we can accept because we've seen it in action that there are methods to short things with the derivatives that exist in the traditional market for public equities and that sort of thing is the uh, uh blockchain crypto universe matured to the point where you can actually execute on that um you know it's accepted that you can execute it with with uh, traditional assets how far along you know are we in being able to do that uh, in your in your view yeah, that, that's a great question. So if if we were having this conversation, maybe, you know, at, at least one or two years ago, I, I would say that the the short, the shorting part of our strategy would be very difficult, um, because the liquidity, you know, just wasn't there. Um, today, and, and we've done obviously a lot of analysis uh, on these markets, but um, the, you know, you can do traditional borrow, borrowing and, and shorting, you know, the traditional way through prime brokers or whatnot, or some of these uh, borrowing and lending protocols where you can borrow the asset and, and effectively short it. Um, but the the easiest and most liquid and most capital efficient way is through uh, something called perpetual swaps, uh, which is a, you know, a kind of a, a futures derivatives uh, that, you know, basically is perpetual when you put the when you put the uh, uh, the trade on um, that allows you to effectively go long or short and use leverage. Uh, and is usually offered through most of the the uh, the large exchanges out there. Um, there are about 350 to 400 tokens out there that have perpetual swaps uh, that you can actually use. Uh, but a lot of them are still very new or very illiquid. Uh, and so, you know, maybe you can short a small amount, but, you know, could you run a half a billion dollar portfolio shorting that? Um, you know, probably not. Um, from our analysis, um, you know, between 100, 100 million to 250 million AUM, uh, there are enough shorts out there to build a very robust short portfolio and, um, and feel confident about the liquidity and everything to run a true long short uh, fundamental hedge strategy. Um, as you get beyond that, it beca becomes much more difficult. You know, you may have to use, you know, placeholder shorts such as you know, shorting a, a large Bitcoin or Ethereum position just because they're more, you know, uh, 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 or liquid, and then balancing that out with shorts that are truly great shorts where you think most of these are going to zero. Uh, but um, you know, right now liquidity, um, there, there's enough to to do this strategy very well and not have to worry about it. Uh, up to about 200, 250 million uh, AUM. Uh, is that helpful, Arthur? Or I can give yeah. more. No, you, no, you got it. That. So that would how uh how much does that depend on the uh i'm going to get some of this wrong the balance sheet 
and the counterparty risk with the market maker or the exchange, where whoever's holding the balance sheet to support that derivative? Yeah, so it, it depends a lot. So um, most of these perpetual swap contracts are offered through centralized exchanges. So the Binance is the world, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, you know, FTX obviously was a big player uh, in that market as well. Um, and so um, if you're going to use these, um, you are taking on some sort of counterparty risk, generally speaking. The way that we go about this, uh, because we're obsessed with counterparty risk, um, we've been in this space long enough to, to really not trust m most entities uh, that are not regulated in a, um, a strong jurisdiction like the US or EU, um, but most of liquidity is, is offshore. So it's like you, you have to pick your poison almost. Um, but the solution to this part, uh, there are custodians out there like Copper uh, that offer something called Clearloop. Um, which is basically a, a mechanism or a platform that, um, to explain it pretty simply, you have your assets or your collateral that you can put in the custodian in a cold storage wallet, right? So this is the safest thing that you can possibly do. Um, and this is what most funds do and most investors do who are dealing with lots, amount, lots of uh, uh, money. Then what you can do by using their clear loop mechanism, you can basically earmark a certain portion of those assets um, in that cold storage and use it as collateral. So then you can go trade on the exchange that is you know, part of the clear loop program. So for example, I may have, I don't know, a um, hundred million of Bitcoin in there or a bunch of different assets in there. And let's say I want to go trade on one of the exchanges they have on there. Maybe it's Deribit or Gate.io or whatever they're offering today. Um, you know, I can basically say, okay, half of the Bitcoin that I own is now going to be used as collateral to go trade on one of these ex exchanges, right? And so they're going to kind of lock that in there so you can't, you know, double spend it or anything like that. Um, but it doesn't move out of your wallet. It doesn't move anywhere on, on chain at all, right? It stays. So they have a way of perfecting the interest and in that portion that's in your wallet. In the exactly. Event that you default or or you're underwater with the LTV. Yeah. So whatever basically, it is. Yeah, yeah. So basically, um, you know, you say, okay, half this uh, Bitcoin in there is going to be used for collateral, so we can't trade it or send it out or anything like that. It has to stay in the wallet. Then I can go on to the exchange. I can put on perpetual swap trades. I can do regular spot trades. I can do whatever I want on the exchange because they're basically fronting me the exposure on the exchange without me actually having to put my assets on there. Um, this is the only way to protect against the principal uh, counterparty risk, right? So let's say if it was Binance or one of these exchanges out there that you know people are, are especially maybe a little nervous about or whatnot. Um, you know, if I'm using the clear loop mechanism, my assets, my principal never moves out of my wallet. So I still have complete control over those assets. If the exchange goes under, I don't lose any of my collateral. Um, so that's still on, on my side. And there's nothing the exchange can do to access that. So if FTX happened, I would have lost no principal from that. Now, the other question is, do they protect against unrealized profits and losses, right? Because especially for us, we're shorting. If FTX happens, you know, the shorts are probably doing very well. That's our hedges, you know, but what if the shorts are on FTX, for example, and you don't have a clear loop uh, mechanism or whatnot, or you're using clear loop mechanism, you know, how do you protect against that? The way it works um, with clear loop is basically the, they aggregate everything on the copper level with all the accounts in clear loop versus the exchange level. And then they kind of settle that in the background to make sure that even though it's unrealized trades in there, that the assets of those are on the right side once every hour or 24 hours based on uh, the, the exchange agreement that they have with the custodian. So not only is your principal being protected by staying on the custodial side. But your uh, wins or losses are every hour perfected. Exactly. Your unrealized profits and losses are also being basically aggregated in the background. So if something truly goes bad, and you can't close that trade out and withdraw, you know, fast enough. Um, it's 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 okay for the most part. It's it's being settled in the background, and so this has already happened. Like Clearloop was with an exchange that did go belly up. Uh, I forget the name of it. Uh, they've been around for a few years now, and just most people didn't know about them. 
Um, most people didn't care until FTX happened. Um, but you know, we've been long saying that the counterparty risks are way too high uh, for, for offshore exchanges, especially. Um, and so what happened was this exchange went, went belly up. Uh, and what the, what the exchange tried to do was come back to copper and say, hey, can you unlock those, you know, the collateral, the principal assets and the unrealized, you know, uh, profits and losses so we can just, you know, get some of our True stuff done on yeah. the side and, and yeah. clear up. And, and of course, copper said no. I mean, that's not how it works. Um, so uh, this has already been tried and true. And what we've seen is that since FTX, just about every custodian we're talking to is coming up with their own clear loop mechanism. And there's a solution for Binance called Seifu, C-E-F-F-U. It's formerly known as Binance Custodian. Uh, it's separate legal entity and tech, uh, technical stuff and everything. Um, I can get into it. But basically, there are solutions out there, and the whole industry is moving this direction. Uh, so you can do shorts and get exposure on exchanges without taking the counterparty risk. But I think just most people either don't know that or, or have you know spent enough time on that side to, to really have a use case for it. So if you uh, are saying that there's probably 200 million of this stuff to do, and let's just say shorts, if three other funds like you establish 100 or 200 million, does that suck up the capacity or is it idiosyncratic to the fund? It, you know, it really depends on what you're shorting. Uh, when I say 200 million, I, I say for our strategy, you know, AUM, uh, you know, you may have 200 million in AUM, but let's say, you know, a, a third of that is shorts, for example, right? I mean, you know, we're, we're usually always net long. Uh, shorts come with risk, right? And I can dive into that and everything, either this call or next call. But um, uh, but uh, yes, you know, there's limited liquidity out there. Uh, we are in a very illiquid environment. I mean, if you look at trading volumes, you know, versus last year or the year prior, uh, you know, uh, volumes are much lower than where they were. Uh, and a lot of this is because of the damage that was done from, um, you know, FTX and Luna blowing up and all the things that happened last year. So I'm saying even in this environment, you know, you can you can run this strategy with with a lot more scale than you can do with a lot of other uh, long short strategies that are either market neutral or arbitrage related or quant related, uh, because those rely on, you know, um, basically generating alpha from from arbitrage. Right. And uh, and those things get squeezed uh, and have alpha decay very quickly. Um, so so, yes, you can do it. And, you know, you can you can even go higher than that. But at some point, your liquidity of, you know, certain assets like the the, the crappiest of the crappy uh, may be too illiquid for you to actually put a short on. So you're going to have to, you know, play with the the portfolio and maybe put some some larger placeholders in some more liquid shorts to allow yourself to have, you know, some some uh, uh, some room for more illiquid shorts that are smaller positions. Is the uh, let's switch gears a little bit in the context of uh, reading through some of the stuff that we talked about your mm -hmm. thesis. And I may not get this right, so help me. Uh, is that the blockchain technology's value in terms of how you see it will be the applications that are built on it as opposed to the token itself? Uh, so uh, I so may not have got that right, but you know what I mean, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so so this this is how we we generally think about it, right? So, uh, and I guess this kind of alludes to the revolutionary or, or scam kind of uh, uh, headline. Um, so we believe, um, just forget blockchain for a second, just ask ourselves like which technology, you know, innovations, technology over the last thousands of years um, end up getting widespread adopted versus which ones do not, right? They end up just, you know, a lot of hype, but they end up being gimmicks. Nobody really uses them. And so we, you know, we have a background in, you know, the tech world and, and studying equities and corporates and sectors uh, of all different types. And, you know, we always try to think of things from first principles. And if you think about it, um, when a new innovation or uh, method of doing things or new technology, when it usually gets widespread adopted and basically goes mainstream and replaces the incumbent technology, it usually has to be cheaper, faster and or safer than the incumbent technology, right? Um, uh, 
uh, you know, if it's not cheaper, faster, and or safer, then why would anybody use it for, for that long? They're just going to end up going back to whatever they were using in the past, you know, to, to do whatever it is they wanted to do. So, uh, you know, in, in the past, we can go to malls, shopping malls, go buy our stuff and, and all that, uh, you know, do, you know, do it basically physically. When the internet came around, now you can order things on Amazon right from your couch, right? Um, and so basically, Amazon made searching and purchasing stuff just faster uh, and cheaper than, you know, just going out to a mall and, and having to spend all that time to do it over there, which also comes with logistical costs and everything that get baked into the product or services uh, that make that avenue, that incumbent avenue more expensive than, than the way the internet has allowed for it. We look at blockchain in the same exact way. Um, so I'm going to share my screen very quickly, uh, just to show a little bit of visuals. So, you know, hopefully you it's a little, it. yeah. uh, it's a little helpful in, in having this. Um, so this is a presentation I gave to Columbia business school, uh, about four months ago on, on how we look at investing in digital assets. Uh, I really just want to focus on this part right here, disruption, um, you know, all the blockchain basically is, is cutting out humans uh, or middlemen and allowing uh, the users or customers of an ecosystem to discover and interact with each other without the middlemen. Um, so the way to think about this is um, humans are generally, when you compare them to computers or, or technology, not, not for everything, but for certain things, uh, are generally um, more expensive. Uh, we're, we're generally a little bit slower, uh, and we generally make more mistakes than you know than computers do once the once the algorithms are are written correctly. Um, so if you can replace uh, a human in a factory, you know, with robots uh, that do the same thing over and over again. If you can replace a human, uh, you know, with an algorithm that can uh, basically figure out something way quicker, you know, all the way starting from, a, you know, calculators, for example, because humans make mistakes every once in a while. Um, well, then, you know, you know, that would obviously make things potentially cheaper, faster and or safer than the way it was done before. Um, if you think about it, all blockchain is basically doing is saying, okay, you know, humans, these corporations, governments that are out there, these, you know, centralized middlemen, basically, um, you know, they, they, they basically hold all the value, and we kind of call them, you know, glorified rent seekers, right? Uh, if you look at the biggest companies in the world, um, or the biggest governments in the world, for example, uh, you know, Google basically is just a, a, a tool or a system that matches people searching for information, with people seeking information or with people with information, right? Uh, you know, Amazon is matching buyers with sellers uh, of products. Um, Facebook is matching you with your friends. Uber is matching, you know, people with cars with people looking for cars. All blockchain is basically saying is like, okay, what happens is that these corporations, they build themselves up once they get some sort of competitive moat uh, or, you know, kind of user or customer capture, then they start jacking up the prices on you or start you know blowing out the advertisements and and making uh the experience not as well and then all the value that's created from that obviously goes to shareholders what blockchain is basically saying is that technology is getting good enough today where we don't need to have those you know corporate middlemen entities uh or infrastructure or redundancy for every little thing that we're doing out there and there's certain things where basically you can cut out the middlemen or cut out pieces of the middlemen and replace it with algorithms or what we call smart contracts and everything. And so by doing that, you basically, you know, can potentially make that utility, that use case, whatever it is, cheaper, faster, and or safer than, you know, how the corporations were doing it before. And then at the same time, those savings from cheaper, faster, and safer don't go back to the corporation, they actually go back to the end users, the customers, right? Which is, if you think about it, think about a, a toll road, for example, that was built, right? They, they built it, you know, maybe 100 years ago, but they're still charging tolls today and they're not even updating the bridge or whatnot. That's, that's what rent seeking is. What blockchain is basically saying is that's not fair and it shouldn't be that, that way forever. At some point, the value should go back to the users, um, and that just makes it for a more you know efficient uh, way of doing things. 
And by tokenizing things and using the blockchain, um, you, that's actually a real possibility today, whereas it, was, it wasn't you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago before when the technology wasn't good enough. And then this starts to get into AI and all that other stuff. So this is how we view everything in blockchain. If it's, if it's not cutting out the middleman or if it's not making things cheaper, faster, and safer versus the incumbent technology, uh, then it's probably not that interesting to us. And there's probably other things that are more interesting that are better blockchain product market fits. I'll, I'll stop there. I know I kind of went yeah. round out on that question. No, that's but... fine. One, you know, based on what you just said, one would argue that the blockchain is the new middleman in some fashion, taking a smaller coupon to do the trade and inuring to the benefit to the consumer, but there's still, if if you uh, if the value of the blockchain that provides the quicker, cheaper, faster, then that ticket, the 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 friction that they take is something less, but they're going to take some friction for being the middleman in that middleman is not, but the catalyst for causing the efficiency is that it, fair it, yeah i think i think that's a fair way to think about it so the whole word cryptocurrencies came about because of bitcoin and ethereum and and you know again we spend a lot of our time well beyond those those tokens and projects and tokens come in all shapes and sizes um you know and and so this slide here gives some examples of of where we see um and i could even show another slide that gets into it a little bit more but Tokens come in all shapes and sizes, right? They can be more like equities. They could be more like currencies or commodities or you know, fixed income, you name it. They can be basically programmed to be any type of asset. And this is why you know, some people believe that most of the assets in the world will be tokenized at some point, because again, it's just a far more efficient system than the current system we use today for transferring value like um, ACH, uh, which takes a couple of days and a $25 fee and you know, the SWIFT network and all that stuff. Um, uh, to go back uh, to your um, uh, question, um, so cryptocurrencies, think of it this way. Um, basically, I, I like to use Uber as an example just because it's it's easy to kind of wrap your brain around. Let's say you had an Uber decentralized application, which looked exactly like and worked exactly like the Uber app that we all have on our phones, right? So you can't even tell the difference that it's it's a blockchain-based thing. And in that Uber DAP uh, or decentralized Uber application, uh, there is no Uber company, right? So you, you basically, that's the big difference between that and the current Uber that we have today. So how would that work in the decentralized world? Well, basically, um, you would still need someone to build it, right? And this is where developers come in. And the developers still need to have some sort of incentive to be able to want to build and spend the time to build a, a, a blockchain version of Uber and everything. And that's where the cryptocurrency or the token comes into play. Um, all the token is, is a way to incentivize all parties uh, to use uh, this new system and then also to transfer value between the, the participants in the system without having any uh, crazy rent seekers uh, in the middle. Um, and the way that works is this. So if you have an Uber cryptocurrency for that blockchain application, uh, and you know I go out there, I you know use the app, it matches me with a driver. Um, basically for me to use, to pay the driver, I have to go buy Uber tokens or Uber cryptocurrencies. Then I can then give that to the driver, pay for my ride. We don't have to, you know, I don't have to pay Uber their cut because there's no middleman. The driver doesn't have to pay Uber their cut because there's no middleman. And we just use the Uber currency to interact with each other. And so generally that ride should be cheaper uh, than, you know, than the Uber version of it. Um, and then so, well, okay, well, then how does the, the, the cryptocurrency uh, go up or have value or whatnot? Well, if the Uber token is a fixed supply and the demand for that new Uber blockchain application continues to go up and supply is fixed, well, then the price of that token is going to go up. And so if I buy a bunch of Uber tokens today and the demand for that application continues to increase over time to the point that, you know, like, let's say the price of the Uber token goes up 5x. 
Um, well, basically, in order for that token to to in dollar value, you know, the, the Uber rides would get too expensive if you didn't offset it on the other side. Uh, maybe it takes 10 Uber tokens to, you know, uh, do one ride uh, when it first started out. But with the price going up 5x, it's going to basically only cost me two Uber tokens to do that ride. Uh, and because I'm holding Uber tokens, and so is the driver, and so is developers, we all basically, our purchasing power of rides has gone up 5x over that time. And we're just sharing the value of that that's being created rather than having to cut any large chunk to an Uber middleman corporate company. Is that too confusing? I'm happy. No, to no, it to actually it totally makes sense. Because, okay. Uh, and therein lies the opportunity for an investor who sees the potential value of that Uber token, your, you know, Black Lotus, to see that that has sustainable long-term value and you invest in the tokens and so that's how you make money. Yeah, exactly. So the, the way I would think about it is like you're you're if it's the if you're buying the Uber tokens, for example, you know, and the price goes up of it, you're you're, you know, again, you have to offset the, you know, the number of Uber tokens it, it costs to do a ride in dollar value, because otherwise the if the price went up and you didn't adjust it, Uber, Uber rides would be too expensive, right? Um, so what, what did I really gain by holding Uber tokens? Well, I gained purchasing power of, uh, of rides, right? And then I can go trade those tokens in a liquid market for purchasing power of dollars, for purchasing power of other tokens that are out there, of, you know, whatever else is out there. So that's the way the economics generally was kind of envisioned of, of how it works. Again, tokens are, they come in all shapes and sizes. Um, you know, some look more like equities. Uh, we actually prefer those. Uh, you know, a lot of these will be listed as securities in our opinion. And I think that's generally a good thing. I, I know a lot of crypto people will disagree with me. Um, some of these look like more like currencies, like the example I gave you. Um, you can say Bitcoin is kind of in that camp, although we look at Bitcoin as just a pure store of value, digital gold. Um, but you can you can program those tokens to do whatever you want. And that's the exciting part of it, right? And that's what's going to give these things far more interesting value uh, in, in my point of view, over the next few decades than what, you know, the current assets that we buy and hold, which is securities like equities or bonds that are, you know, just kind of static and, and just do one thing. Um, this is the big opportunity in our opinion. Is, is the risk in your example that it isn't programmed from the onset to account for not making the Uber trip too expensive? Like, is there just a, I, I don't need to get into the weeds, but the immediate yeah. comes to mind is, you know, how, how, do, how do you make it so that new middleman, the token, doesn't harvest like the corporation would have harvested by, you know, being super profitable? Aside from people wouldn't use it, yeah. it's expensive, but. Yeah, so um, technology is is net de deflationary. So I know we're going through inflation right now, but um, you know we have a commodities and macro background, and and I could point to a lot of things of why you're seeing inflation today across food, energy, you know, assets across the board. Uh, but generally, for the last twelve years, uh, we you know the government's been trying trying to fight deflation, right? Um, and it's it's not a shock, right? Like technology is supposed to make things cheaper, faster, and or safer, right? If it's not doing that, then why would anybody use it? Um, and if it becomes cheaper, faster, and or safer, that means it should cost less, right? And this is the idea, like the standard of living today, you know, the 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 poorest people in the world could could you know at least afford enough food to to hopefully, um, I mean, you know, certain countries obviously aren't there yet, but um, you know, it's it's. Things are much more accessible today, whereas a few hundred years ago, you know, um, only only kings could eat steaks or whatever, right? Um, and that's just because technology of producing food has gotten so much better, and the cost to produce a lot of things have gotten so much better. Blockchain is basically the like the singularity version of that. It is like trying to basically replace everything with algorithms and just cut out humans almost completely. That's all it re really is doing. Um, so if that's the case, well, then why should these tokens be worth anything, right? Because if the value that you're charging um, or, you know, that that basically the, the customers or the end users are getting 
is far cheaper than what it was when we were using one of the centralized corporations to do that thing. You know, there's not a lot of value to go around. And then on top of that, crypto is generally software based, right? Um, we've seen copycat new tokens come out every single day. Uh, most of this is open source. So new blockchain projects can just come in and, and just try to copy everything. And so if there are no competitive moats, uh, most of these things are a race to the bottom. So to answer the question of revolutionary versus scam, uh, we believe that most tokens are worth nothing. Uh, they will be basically competed to zero. They'll, 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 they'll be commoditized. This is great for users over time because it'll be very cheap to use these things. Uh, this will not be good for investors, obviously. It makes our jobs much harder. However, there are certain blockchain projects and tokens that we do think can create competitive moats, uh, just like in the traditional world, uh, whether that's network effects, whether that's IP, whether that's talent, whether that's first mover advantages, those are the ones we focus on. And those are the ones that we want to go long. Those are the ones that we think have 100x potential from here uh, that most people aren't even aware of. And then we just short everything else that we think is going to zero. Um, so uh, um, that's how we look at it. Um, but it really depends. Like, you know, it's not black and white. Every token is very different and how we analyze every token can be very different. Um, so it, you just have to do the research. There's, there's no other way around it. Is that yeah, helpful? We're going to get to that. that. Yeah, we'll get to that research point in a minute. Let's just uh, take one of these here. Do you believe the application layer is better off without proprietary tokens as it can create volatility in users and therefore revenues based on price? rather than driving by the utility of the application. So do I, so just to say that back, so do yeah, I yeah. believe- Do you believe the, the application, application layer, layer is better off better with off without proprietary that. tokens? Yeah, so um, I'll answer that directly and then also maybe indirectly just to, just to uh, kind of share how we think about this. So we honestly, we think over time over the next you know few decades, um, that most blockchains will be commoditized. Um, that actually the layer one blockchain level, you know, those things will be commoditized. I mean, there are hundreds of blockchains out there, each of them with their own tokens, and they're all trying to do the same thing. Uh, the only reason why they um, there is difference in differences in value today, and they're, they're, that there actually is competitive moats with you know Ethereum with the network effects. Uh, some other new ones with, uh, um, you know, maybe it's scalability, maybe they're cheaper, they're faster to use or whatnot, um, is because there's so much friction in the technology. Uh, you know, we, you know, I know adoption has happened very fast and people compare crypto adoption to the internet, like the late 90s of the internet. I, we, we, we believe that too, but the technology part, the supply side part looks more like the 1980s of the internet. It is, it is not very, anyone who spent time in the blockchain world using these decentralized applications and self-custody wallets like MetaMask, it is painful. You know, um, I do this professionally and I'm still double checking every time I send tokens or I connect to an app because there's hacks all the time. Uh, it's so user unfriendly. You make one wrong move and you lose your money and there's no customer service to go to. We're not there yet. Um, we're still a few years away from that. We're just investing today in anticipation that they're solving that stuff and we feel very confident they are. To go back to the question of, so the reason why I brought that up is you have 95% of the money in blockchain layer one tokens like Bitcoin, Ethereum, so on and so forth, and only 5% of that in decentralized applications. Um, we believe that applications have a better chance at building competitive moats than the blockchains, because again, the blockchains are just doing kind of generalized stuff. Once everything is good enough, interoperable, decentralized enough, scalable enough, you know, who cares what blockchain I'm processing on? Um, you know, all I care about is when I borrow and lend through this application, does it work? Is it cheap? Is it safe? And we're already seeing a lot of these applications in the, in the DeFi world go multi-chain, right? They start off on Ethereum and now they're moving over to Cosmos or Avalanche or, you know, any one of the other compatible chains. And the users don't even care, right? Like they're just like, hey, is it cheaper? Okay, I'll, I'll go wherever you take me. And because the applications, um, if you think about the internet, uh, it wasn't HTTPS or the protocols that made all the money. Those were free. 
And the reason they ended up being free is because any of the ones that charged money to build on top of it, no one used, no one used, right? Yeah. So it was Google, it was Amazon, it was Facebook, it was everything built on top, Yahoo, who ended up capturing the users, building competitive moats and making all the money, right? These are your trillion dollar companies today. Um, we think the same is going to happen in the blockchain world. So if, if that narrative shifts even a little bit, again, only 5% of the market cap is in applications. Um, you know, we believe that there's 10x, 100x opportunities all over the place. Uh, it's only a matter of time. Um, and so that's why we spend a lot of time over there. However, if the application doesn't have a token or a liquid way to invest in it, then the only way you can invest in it is really through um, the centralized entity that created that application uh, doing a, a traditional VC, you know, kind of safe or, or equity uh, 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 placement. You can do that, but it's not going to be any different than a company just building a, 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 a website on, on something, right? It's centralized. It's not to the ethos of crypto. Um, now, you can use something like Ethereum tokens or other tokens as the currency within that. Uh, we've definitely seen that happen. But at some point, you need to find a way to you know, capture at least some value uh, or incentivize users within that application or ecosystem to interact with each other and transfer value among each other. Because if you don't, then the developers um, you know, aren't gonna be very incentivized. Uh, they're just gonna be rent seekers. That's what they're gonna turn into. Um, the users are gonna you know, be like, well, this isn't really blockchain. It's no different than me using the, the, the traditional Uber application. So why do I care? Uh, Ethereum is gonna benefit a lot from that. Um, but this is why you see most applications end up creating a token because you need some, you know, kind of a uh, walled garden mechanism to transfer value and, and incentivize users in the ecosystem to interact with each other. Um, and then also you can have more control over that uh, if you're part of that ecosystem than having control over Ethereum, which, you know, uh, you're, you're basically inheriting all the, the baggage that goes with that. So hopefully that wasn't too much of a convoluted way of answering that question. No, I think it was good. Uh, and let's not spend too much time on this next one, but in your view, for those of us that are very pedestrian about this, is the, whatever they called it, Ethereum did to reduce the gas and the friction, is that you know enough to solve the problem for Ethereum and how much it cost it because the transaction fees were just outrageous, right? Yeah. So this is this is the problem I have with blockchain and, and the current model of how they extract value. And this is why um, I generally disagree with most of the reports that you see out there on Ethereum. Uh, look, if Ethereum was the only game in town, the only blockchain that people were building stuff on and there was no competitors, for sure, it's going to be worth trillions of dollars. The token is going to go up crazily and that's all you got. But we live in a competitive world. And unfortunately, for you know, for any incumbents in blockchain, anyone can copy the code, launch their own, you know, version, and then just use whatever gimmicks they can to try to steal users. And we see that every single day. Hundreds of new projects come out trying to do the same thing. Um, so the problem I have is Ethereum is very expensive, the technology is very old, and that's why they're using layer twos or sharding or these upgrades to try to fix that. Effectively, what's happening is, for example, layer twos, right? In order to reduce the congestion on Ethereum layer one, um, which makes the fees and Ethereum tokens worth more, um, you basically have to take transactions off that layer one, roll it up and do it on layer two, right? That's, that's the whole point is that the layer twos can batch a bunch of transactions together, roll it up into one 100x efficiency, and then settle just one trade on the Ethereum ledger. Well, if you do that at 100x um, you know, efficiency, well, then the, the need for ETH tokens to you know, transact with is going to go down 100x. And if the demand or transaction volumes goes down 100x, then why should the token price go up, right? Because it's just supply and demand. So what does the ETH token become if you take that to its logical conclusion, right? If you don't need much ETH to transact, to transact on Ethereum, why should it be worth anything? You know, then it just then the only value it has is as a store of value. 
this is why I'm saying this is kind of a race to the bottom. It's kind of this catch-22. The way to solve the blockchain scalability and the expensiveness of tokens as, as congestion goes up is by, you know, basically making the, the need for tokens go down by using layer twos or moving those transactions elsewhere. It's just a weird catch-22. You know, I can make a case that Ethereum is extremely overvalued, um, but but they do have moats, right? They have network effects. They have, you know, both on the user and demand side. They are, you know, kind of viewed as a, as a store of value for their ecosystem or a medium of exchange. So I'm not saying Ethereum is a bad investment or anything, but those are the things you have to think about. When I see models that try to model out the fees that Ethereum is making and, you know, the buybacks and burns and everything, that is assuming that they're not going to get any more efficient and that all the users are going to stay on Ethereum. Uh, if they're too, if they're more expensive than their incumbents, uh, and their incumbents kept up, catch up in technology, and they're just cheaper and faster to use, and they're just just as safe, why would anybody stay there? You know, so um, so that's my problem with the blockchain token model, uh, and I think there's better models to to maybe value Ethereum, uh, but yeah, hopefully that answers uh, it is, a bit. Yeah, is it fair to compare, uh, for example, in banking or insurance? the legacy systems that they were so dependent on and then new technology came in and then they would build on top of that with a interface to patchwork and then it just became a, a nightmare. And rather than retooling the whole system because it was too daunting of a task, they just kept on layering on new tech and interfacing with the old tech. And, you know, all the tech people in the insurance company would pull their hair out because they couldn't figure out how to integrate it all is that a similar type problem yeah i mean you know i i don't want to say ethereum is like the myspace to the facebook or or anything like that um, yeah, it's, but it's you too, just did <laughs> <laughs> well it's 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 yeah. just too early to tell the, the yeah. point i don't think um you know like i i like ethereum uh for its network effects it's pioneered everything it's it's where the most activity happens and honestly most of the applications the tokens that we own are, are built on Ethereum. So, you know, go figure. So it's yeah. not that I don't like Ethereum. It's just, it's hard for me to build a model around valuing that token based on revenue flow when I know that revenue flow is about to get smacked, right? Because everything they're doing is to try to reduce revenues going into Ethereum to make it cheaper to use, right? So it's just a weird, weird thing. Um, in my opinion, um, the applications have a better chance at capturing users and making you know it sticky, because when you interact with Ethereum, you don't. There's no Ethereum application UX UI, right? You're either using a self custody wallet like MetaMask, and then you're connecting that to a decentralized application like Aave, which is borrowing and lending, or uh, Uniswap decentralized exchanges, or Axie Infinity, which is gaming. You know, those are the things that you're actually using day to day. -to -day. Those are where your habits are going to get built. And so, you know, if I like playing this video game, if I like using Aave or Uniswap, there's no, you know, there's no reason for me to go anywhere else unless something is truly cheaper, faster, or, and or safer than that application. And that's why those guys, I think, have a better chance of building customer stickiness and competitive moats. And then they could take their users wherever they want, you know. Nobody, I think most people won't care whether it's done on Ethereum or Solana or Bitcoin or whatever, as long as it's safe enough. And that comes down to decentralization. Look, I mean, we grew up in a corporate world, centralized world. We've been okay with it for thousands of years. I don't think, like, I don't see new users coming in. It's like, oh, this is not decentralized enough. I'm not going to use this. That's not a good enough reason. Yeah. It's yeah. not a good enough reason. You know, normal people don't care. They really don't. But what they do care about is how much is this costing me? Uh, how how hard and difficult and slow is this to use? You know, uh, is this just as safe as me using something else? They do know that. That's tangible in their brain. Um, and so we've seen that time and time again. And I don't think I, I don't know why blockchain wouldn't evolve in the same way. Yeah, I think that um, if you don't mind just pulling it up for one second, a lot of the folks and and. I, I shouldn't put people, but it, seemingly a lot of the folks are not doing the research. So the research report is what I was looking for. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. That you guys are doing because, you know, they've got some tokens, they've got some Bitcoin, they want to uh, 
you know, not give it up, but they want to see if they can, uh, you know, play play the value game. And they're not looking into it deep the way you guys are looking in, and others. You're not the only ones, obviously. Um, sure. but, you know, I just wanted the group to see how, like, this is a research report like anybody would do to, to do research in a, a public market stock, you know, public equities. And, yeah. Uh, you don't see that. Uh, yeah. The, the reason why I had this example up is, first off, we have a neutral opinion. It's, it's old. So, you know, I don't have to, I don't want to offend anybody with something uh, that we're looking at long or short uh, today. But um, uh, this is just an example, right? And you can see it looks just like a sell side report at a bank. And, and that's the whole point. Like, you can research these projects, these tokens, just like you can research a company or a stock. Uh, you know, fixed income, you name it, all these traditional assets classes that we, we come from. Uh, the, there's metrics, a lot of them are old, but there's also newer ones that you have to factor in. We, we did have to adapt a lot of our frameworks, our research processes, and so on and so forth for this unique asset class and for all different types of tokens and sectors and, and use cases and so on. But as you can see, there's a lot to do here. Um, it's just most of the market is very young, uh, very retail oriented, trader oriented, or quant oriented. Uh, the institutions are slowly coming in, but they're not quite there yet. Uh, and that's why we basically try to build something for them, for them to come in. Uh, but the ones who really care about fundamentals, um, you know, people say, oh, crypto fundamentals don't matter. You know, everything is just trading. It's all speculative. That is true. Uh, narratives in the short term uh, drive prices just like any other asset class that I've ever worked in. But in the long term, just like any other asset class I've, I've worked in, fundamentals drive narratives, right? If an application isn't getting users versus another application, all else equal, if it's not growing, if it's not making revenues, look, the prices eventually is going to reflect that or the narratives are going to shift. Um, maybe it doesn't happen overnight. Maybe it takes a few years. But generally, we've seen, if you go back to 2017 researching things, even meme coins, I can point to social metrics that kind of justify why Dogecoin is in the top 15 versus another meme coin that doesn't have the same level of community, same level of engagement on Reddit and Twitter and all that stuff. Um, so this is an example of one where you can see we've done research on it in the past. We look at competitive modes, value capture for the token, uh, tokenomics, which is understanding how the economics of the token actually captures value, which is very important. Uh, dilution is always something that you have to factor in with, with tokens because there's a lot of minting, uh, basically inflation with, with a lot of these projects. Uh, that's how they get users. Um, bull bear case scenarios, uh, revenues, you name it, demand, uh, the industry competitors. Um, and then we even like do subjective scores on different elements of, you know, this project, like, okay, how strong is their competitive moat versus other storage, you know, file coin competitors, for example, which is decentralized storage, uh, how decentralized it, all that stuff. Like you can do this. Um, we just don't see many people doing it because one, it takes a lot of work. Um, it's something that, you know, you, you learn when you work in the traditional hedge fund world and it takes years of, 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 of research and, and building those, you know, that experience up. And then, um, you know, we're, we're taking a long-term oriented approach. Uh, that to us is where the biggest inefficiencies lie. And so, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to compete in an area where no one's really attacked that yet. And we think that's where the biggest opportunities are uh, for the long-term. Um, yeah, yeah. I haven't seen anything like this. Yeah, in, in this world. Super, super helpful. Well, that, that was an amazing discussion. We're running out of time, but I, I really appreciate your insights, and I'm sure everybody else does as well. Um, so we're going to come back next week, I think it is, and uh, talk a little, get more into the weeds about the fund, uh, with the intent of uh, getting some LPs into the fund, just to be clear. Um, and so we we'll look forward to doing that. Uh, the uh, is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap it up? No, I appreciate the time and everything. Uh, hopefully this was informative. Um, there's a lot we didn't cover, like how to value tokens, all that stuff. Um, I'm more than happy to connect with anyone after this. Uh, you know, uh, we, we always say it's maybe better us than crypto Twitter uh, or, or something, but 
Um, if you have any questions or if you want a, a copy of the slides and just want to look through stuff and, and self-learn or whatnot, um, you know, that's what we're here for. So please don't hesitate. Uh, you know, we're more than happy to do that. And then, uh, and then, yeah, I guess we'll have our conversation next week to, to get into the nuts and bolts of how we actually research and, you know, segregate this universe out between the best of the best investments versus the worst of the worst shorts. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm excited about that. Yeah, super helpful. Really, really appreciate you being here today, Andrew. And uh, again, with the group, you make sure everybody's directly in touch with Andrew and you're welcome, as he said, to contact him directly. And if there's anybody in your world that would benefit in speaking with him and connecting, um, you're most welcome to do so. And I, I, I noticed uh, your quote, um, uh, the because I close these with my favorite saying is that thank you for spending with us the only thing you can't make more of and that's your time till next time thank you, <laughs> sounds good thank you so Thanks much Arthur. thank you everyone bye, bye, -bye.